So I'm really curious about how each of you have developed the capacity to respond uh, to other people's very well-intentioned, but often very misguided attempts to, to help. How do you avoid taking on their, their judgments and their expectations um, that might you know, get in the way of your own healing process and, and really make you know, uh, what they're offering um, not just less of a help, but could be even hurtful? Thank you, Sue. Absolutely. So, Daniel, how would you respond? Uh, initially, I feel very sad and upset, but I also understand people mean well. My wife keeps saying, do what you should do and focus on your own recovery. And that is in line with what Addison has been coaching, which is, to focus on myself, focus on my body. People want us to do more and get better, and I'm not going to let them down. One good example was when I was in the hospital, and uh, uh, you know my vocal cord left side was paralyzed. So for about a year, if I'm talking to you, let's say three feet away, I feel I was yelling. However, you could barely hear me. So I was very frustrated, and there was a psychologist coming to coach me, and she basically said, well, you know, if that function is gone, probably what you can do is to wear an amplifier and a microphone with you, and you can still communicate with the rest of the world. Now, I got very frustrated with her comments, but my wife said, she meant well. You will work on it. You will make improvements. You will prove how much you can recover by yourself. And I think a lot of the coaching Addison has given me is in exactly the same direction. And that helped me tremendously. And <clears throat> when I had a stroke and I was just back in <clears throat> San Anselmo, um, I met Ron Kovac, who is a, who, uh, born on the 4th of July, you know, was about, about <clears throat> and uh, he, he noticed me, you know, he's in a wheelchair, and he noticed me, and I couldn't talk, and he talked to me. And that was so important, because I felt like I was heard, and it was like, you know, uh, and um, so I would walk there, you know, like tw twice, three times a week because I knew that he would be at the cafe, um, you know, and have Ron there to say hi to me because I was profoundly disabled. I was walking with a limp, with my arm down, with my face. Others would walk across the street with their kids so that they wouldn't have to uh, see me. And so, you know, I'm just so to Ron for teaching me lesson. He left much before I had the chance to say thank you. That's very beautiful, Rita. It touches me deeply. Although I have made a very good recovery, there are things that are difficult for me to do still. And I become more awkward when I'm upset. So if somebody comes to me and says, oh, can I help you? Or here, let me do this for you, which is more likely. Here, let me do this for you. That actually injures me. They're well-intended. They mean to be nice to me. But because I'm trying to cope with getting up out of the car, picking up something, making my leg work after I've been sitting for a long period of time, they're interfering in what I'm trying to do because they think they know what I need actually makes it harder for me to do what I need to do. <clears throat> if they come to me and they say, 
is there anything I can do to help you? And they stand back and they ask that question with honesty and respect and they wait for my answer, then they can be a benefit. But if they jump in my face and try to do things for me, that's not okay. And I get really angry and I feel really small. I don't want to feel small. I want to be respected, helped if I need to be helped, and if I ask for help. But I don't want to be the object of somebody else's pity. So how they approach me and what's in their heart shows up on their face and how they help me. And I would ask anybody who's working with somebody who is disabled, to be respectful and to say, what is there something I can do? And not assume that I need help. Maybe I don't. Even if it's more awkward for me to get something done, maybe I don't need help. So that's what I would ask for. And when it comes to emotions, and I'd like to hear everybody on this, I really don't like it when somebody who has not had my experience says to me, oh, you ought to feel this way. You ought to be happy. You ought to be this. You ought to be that. How do they know? And how is that respectful? What do the rest of you think? Well, I cry a lot when I'm mad. You know, I just like it, it, the waterworks start and I, I don't even know when it's going to happen. And, I, you know, I, I appreciate when people, you know, back up and, you know, just, you know, I can cry and, and do the, that or something like that. When, when I get upset and they get upset and go away from me, you know, is very, so now I'm crying and I get angry. <laughs> and it goes into, you know, and, and, you know, maybe I can, you know, after 19 and a half years, you know, I, I have the wherewithal, you know, but six months into the stroke, I didn't have the wherewithal, you know, uh, 10 years into the stroke, I didn't have the wherewithal, you know. I was very lucky. I was sent to the Northridge Hospital, uh, which was, which is the best rehab hospital in Los Angeles. And I met two outstanding doctors that I'll be thankful to my life. One is Dr. Kevin. The day I was discharged, he came out just to say goodbye to me and said this. He said, when you came, you were very severely injured. I know you will keep fighting. Your, your recovery will continue. And then one day, you'll be going back to do the dream things you've been dreaming about. And it's only a matter of time. As a neurological doctor, I can tell you, we are all doing the research. There'll be more progresses, but don't wait for us. Try what you need to try. I just know you will recover. And uh, that same day, the director of the Northridge Hospital Rehab Program also came out to say goodbye to me. He's a gentleman in a scooter. He shared with, with me this story. He said, many years ago, a top student in John Hopkins University, when he was about to graduate, he got a deadly neural infection that almost took his life. But luckily he survived. And ever since then, he could not stand up by ever again. He said, that person was me. For two years, I was in my bed. I was crying. I was depressed. But thank God, I got more meaningful things out of it. Today, this man built the number one rehab program in Southern California. He's in a scooter joking around. Everybody in that rehab program, doctors, nurses, neurologists, psychologists, they feel proud working for him. 
he's the most positive person I've ever met. And he said, do I wish I could stand up and play football again? He said, that's in my dream every night. However, every day I woke up, I never let anything stop me from doing what I should do. And he built, ground up, the best program to help the survivors. What he set up is a live example how to reclaim your life in face of major disaster injury that you never planned for. Oh, that's wonderful, Daniel. Yeah, and I, you know, I just want to, to thank you all for your, these, uh, you know, these wonderful perspectives on your um, experience because I think this is, it, it seems to me, just a, such an important area for uh, for stroke survivors to hear each other's stories because there are a lot of well in, well intentioned um, <laughs> misguided uh, people out there <laughs> that um, I and I think that it's just really important that um, that stroke survivors be able to retain their sense of wholeness as they move through their recovery. So thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you.